Now we go to look at Governor Burke, the third governor to come to the colony after Macquarie. Burke's predecessors were Governors Brisbane and Darling respectively as we've talked about. Now unlike Burke's predecessors, Burke was a Whig and as we remember the definition of this is that of a political party that, that, that favoured the King should be subordinated to parliamentary rule. In modern parlance we would probably call the Whigs the Progressive Party as against perhaps the Conservative Party. I'm Michael Bishel, Australian historical fiction writer here again and, and we look at Governor Richard Burke and his tenure in New South Wales from 1831 until late 1837 which was really the end of the early colonial period. In a hot December all these poor governors who arrived in the colony had to arrive in December to a stinking hot summer. I mean it was unbelievable. Now His Excellency Richard Burke stepped ashore in Sydney to a multitude of, of applause. After arriving at Government House he swore an oath to uphold his role in New South Wales as Captain General. Now for those of you who have seen my previous videos, know the background of that illustrious domestic residence, Government House. In the Sydney Gazette it was said that, an open quote, the jailer at Parramatta was very happy to see His Excellency the Governor because he himself had been a neighbour of His Excellency in Ireland. Hey, little bit of a story. Burke was a good looking man, born in Dublin on 4th of May 1777 and educated at Oxford University. Then he became an ensign in the Grenadier Guards in 1798. He was injured in war in the jaw and that thwarted his role in politics. After the Napoleonic Wars he retired with his beloved wife to Thornfield near Limerick. He was a Protestant but he was not entirely antithetical to the Roman Catholic. He wasn't a bigot Protestant, quite a liberal actually. In Limerick he wanted to reform politics which was a natural weak tendency. He went to Cape Colony in South Africa in 1826 and had a controversy there which would later be used against him unfairly in New South Wales. When he arrived in New South Wales, his wife was in an advanced stage of illness, the cause of which we have no idea, but we can probably safely say it was a very advanced stage of cancer. It must have been totally distressing for both of them to arrive in a, in a strange new land and she was very ill. Now we've seen from the past videos of Wentworth, MacArthur and Marsden that other than Wentworth, the rest were conservatives in thinking and living. So for a Whig governor, progressive governor like Burke, to be thrust upon these with his progressive views on the advancement of all was anathema to the MacArthur's Marsden and, and, and Campbell and so forth. So from the beginning, Burke was literally pushing the proverbial uphill. We have seen in previous videos all the machinations and fights between the emancipists and the exclusives where Burke's name was referred. So we won't go over that again when the Reverend Scott was recalled, a new man took over who was the Archdeacon Broughton. Now <laughs> Broughton landed and said look I want a better deal. He wanted a better salary and more importantly he wanted recognition as the most important religious person in New South Wales. Now this belief in the Anglican Church as being the most important should according to him have the most seniority and that the Anglican Church should be the most important church in the colony. Now Broughton did himself no favours in pursuing this line. The British government was sensible. They had, they, and they had plans to send Wesleyan mission, missionaries to the islands, some near, some near New South Wales, and Broughton was adamant that the Anglican churches should still dominate. We shall talk about the, the wars on religion in another article. Now the timing of Governor Burke's, his wife's death in May 1832 struck, struck him very very hard indeed. Uh, to all intents and purposes their marriage was a strong one and he would miss the absence of his long-term partner. Mrs Burke faced her end with calmness, determination and resignation and passed away on the 7th of May. They buried the remains of the lamented lady at Parramatta on the 10th of May and according to the Herald in a solemn and impressive ceremony, His Excellency, his family, the clergy, the judges, 
the heads of government and departments and most of the senior civil servants and military officers of the colony following in the train to the graveside where the Reverend Broughton committed her body to the dust from when she came. Now, in his grief, Richard Burke turned more and more to Francis Forbes for comfort, the Attorney General, Chief Justice. And Francis Forbes returned the warmth and tenderness himself. We'll leave Governor Burke at that point in time and we'll return to him soon. I'm Michael Bischel. Bye. For just a little bit, we'll be back soon.